Welcome to Woodless Wildlife Wednesdays. I love this picture on the screen. I'll tell you, you know, they're all my favorite, but I will say my favorite. Look at this possum over here with his little possum posse on his back and that American kestrel, that American kestrel. There's something about it. I don't know what it is about it, but I, I, I am drawn to that American kestrel. If we were in real life right now, I would ask you all what you are attracted to on this on this screen. Is it that um, uh, the butterfly there? What is it that you're 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 in? You know, you're welcome to put that in the chat if you want to let me know. I'm curious what you guys what you guys love out there. So today's webinar is wildlife ecology and management in Maryland. Uh, there's some deer there. There's the the uh, woodpeckers there. Next month, we're going to have um, ecology and management of wood duck. That is a personal favorite of mine. I've been doing wood duck box monitoring at Pickering Creek Autobahn um, here on the shore for about three, three seasons now. And we have Ducks Unlimited next month to talk about the um, wood duck. I'm super excited about that one too. But you all know if you've joined us for any of them, I do get pretty excited about these. So the webinar is going to be recorded. So um, you can see that your video is not there, nor is your um, uh, audio. So that's okay. Um, and you, we can get the recording on our website. And uh, I am your host today. My name is Agnes Kedmanitz. I work for University of Maryland Extension. I am part of the forestry program where I engage landowners in forestry activities, stewardship activities. I go and uh, visit. I'm actually going to be visiting a school uh, next week. I'm going to landowners in a couple of days, you know, talking to them about their woods and what their, their options are to meet their objectives. And I also coordinate the Maryland Delaware Master Logger Program. I feel really privileged in my position where I get to talk to forestry professionals and landowners, you know, sharing ideas on both ends. So I feel like I feel uh, very privileged in my job. So if you have any forestry questions, there's my email. Feel free to contact me. I'd love to talk to you about the forest or your trees. If you have any questions or comments during the presentation, the chat box is at the bottom of your screen. It looks like that talk bubble there. Feel free to put them in there. Any comments, good, clean jokes about wildlife, I'm open to them. You can send them to um, benefits of registering for the webinar is uh, you get the quarterly newsletter. If you're already not a subscriber to the Branching Out newsletter, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised with this uh, Branching Out newsletter. You're going to stay abreast of uh, forestry events. Uh, forestry tips and, and, and tricks. Uh, but if you want to opt out on that, there's that email there for Pam that you can say no events and then you will not get that newsletter. So today's webinar is a broad overview of ecological practices applicable to wildlife management in Maryland with highlights of how to identify plants and animals and best practices to manage habitat to support wildlife and reduce problems. What a fine balance we're gonna be talking about. Support wildlife and reduce problems. This is gonna be an interesting talk today. Great balancing act here. So our speaker today, you know, one of my colleagues at the Y Research and Education Center, uh, the University of Maryland Wildlife Management Specialist. Luke, I think this might be his year anniversary here with us. Um, so. Let me tell you a little bit more about him. He's a Luke's extension program provides educational information to a variety of groups and stakeholders, including wildlife enthusiasts and naturalists, people experiencing issues with wildlife damage and game management for hunting. Luke earned his PhD from University of California, Berkeley. We're glad he's here. There's his email address. You guys, you wanna get that down in case you have any questions. I know he's working on some really great projects these days. So this is the guy you wanna to talk to if you have wildlife questions. So, oh wait, before we get to Luke's, I wanted to ask everybody, you heard me say that I'm from the um, Eastern shore. Uh, where are you guys from? Let's find out where you're from. I don't know, um, our office, Luke, we're out of the Y Research and Education Center and that's on the shore in Queenstown, Maryland. Um, you know, he's doing some great experiments there too. Um, so that's where we're from. Well, we got some Western Maryland, some Central Maryland. You guys, this is great. We've got a nice variety here. We got those, um, 
mountains. Oh, I hope it's cooler there for you than it is here on the shore. Good. Okay, you guys, thank you for letting, letting us know where you're from. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, I'm gonna invite Luke to share his screen. So thank you, Luke, for joining us today. I'm excited. This is our first Woodland Wildlife Wednesday together. Hi, um, Agnes, thank you very much. Um, has my screen shown up? Do we have a, everything seems to be coming through okay? Everything's okay. Great. I'm gonna turn my, my video and my mute off, but I'm gonna be right here. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you everybody for joining. Um, as Agnes mentioned, I've uh, started this position about a year ago and it's the first time to present at uh, Woodland Wildlife Wednesday. So uh, been working, uh, new, relatively new to the state, so I'm learning a lot. And, uh, and this is probably the best uh, presentation I've come up with yet. I keep learning and adding more. So um, hope this is helpful for all of you. And uh, please let me know if, if the audio or the video doesn't work well and we can, I can turn off my video to help that. Um, so to get started on our first slide here, um, I like to use three-legged stools. They're always uh, courtesy of Wayfair, this image right here. Um, I'd like to cover three broad topic areas today. And I, I thought it would be nice to have a, just a broad wildlife management presentation for Maryland. Um, and we'll start with uh, the first, we're gonna cover ecological concepts, some broad themes of ecology um, that I think will be useful to understand as we uh, dig more into the second topic of wildlife ecology. And we'll talk a little bit about population dynamics and how different animals, um, populations grow and change and aspects of that. And finally, we'll dig into management and how we can influence uh, the animals and uh, vegetation and habitat and people uh, for wildlife. So to get started on ecological concepts, I like to think about um, scale, both spatial scale, temporal scale, and broad concepts of habitat. So for spatial scale, it's, it's so important to think about when we're talking about wildlife management, what are we, what's the, what's the sort of spatial area we're talking about? I mean, we can start at the broadest of the globe, the whole world. Obviously there's a lot of things that can influence, um, influence wildlife at these global scales, whether it's uh, climate change or large natural catastrophes. Um, as you zoom into the regional level, um, a good way to start thinking about scale at this level are what we call physiographic provinces. And here's an image of the east, eastern coast of the United States with five or six major physiographic provinces. Now, uh, I'd like to zoom in a little bit more to our state of Maryland and think about uh, these physiographic provinces here. So we're blessed, they call Maryland America in miniature. We're blessed to have mountains, um, on down to foothills, Piedmont areas, and on down to the plains. Um, and each of these habitats, uh, each of these physiographic provinces provide unique characteristics for different types of species. Now, certainly some wildlife species generalists can uh, move across all of these and are common across all these physiographic provinces, but many others are very unique or they're specialized to particular types of soil or elevation that you'll only find say in the Appalachian Plateau or in the Ridge and Valley physiographic provinces. Uh, the blue Piedmont area is, uh, is a sort of transition zone from those uh, Appalachian mountains on down to the coastal plain. And in this map, we have a breakdown between the upper coastal plain and the lower coastal plain, um, which is the Western shore and the Eastern shore. Um, but these uh, coastal plain areas tend to be um, sedimentary uh, soils and uh, much lower lying types of habitat. And so we're at the state, you can move down, down to the landscape scale and you see this image here where you can start to think about how community developments and individual farms or forests and rivers start to influence wildlife. And zooming in even further, you can come into your yard, your garden, and how uh, th these sort of areas can influence uh, how we manage wildlife. And you can go even further and further and further 
Um, we'll stop at this level, but even these sort of micro habitat areas, whether it's a pile of mulch or a pile of rocks, um, provide um, kind of unique habitat for a variety of species. I found lizards and amphibians really like to hang out, frogs, toads, uh, hang out under these rock areas or in these mulch beds, as an example. And so I, I like to spend some time on spatial scale just to, as a broad overview because it really can influence our actions and what is the, what we can do. Um, here's an image of a bobwhite quail here. And um, I wish we could, uh, in a few acres, in just a, my yard or an acre or two, create enough habitat for this species to, to survive and persist. But they really need something on the order of 50 to 100 or even a few hundred acres to have populations that survive. So now we're shifting gears to temporal scale. So we've got the spatial scale, scale now temporal scale. And that's, that's the concept of time. So in the geological time scale, of course, at the broadest level, we have hundreds of millions of years of life on this planet and major changes that have undergone over time. Um, at the evolutionary scales. Um, certainly there have been major issues of disturbance on our planet. Here's a image of uh, a major asteroid hit a uh, strike on the earth that's believed to have caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. And certainly these disturbances um, are catastrophic and damaging, but they also lead to these new recoveries and formations of new uh, evolutionary relationships and adaptations um, on our planet. Um, now moving in again, uh, we're starting very broad temporal scales and moving into narrower and narrower um, time frames. Um, and something that I think is most relevant for us is something on, on the human lifetime scale, and that's the concept of succession. Um, this uh, this image and uh, it comes from the Woods in Your Backyard uh, book that uh, was uh, written. Uh, our, our very own Jonathan Cave was a co-author of this uh, publication, and has a great image of how uh, succession changes over time. Um, the whole the main idea behind succession is that you have uh, have this change on the landscape, especially here on the eastern coast of the United States, uh, you have uh, this movement of uh, habitat from grassland and very low areas after disturbance, say, say it's a mowing or a fire occurs. Um, and over time, these grasslands will start to have more shrubs and seedlings in them. And then the seedlings then grow into saplings and pole trees. And over time, these saplings grow into mature forests on the right. Um, and this process can take up to 100 years and even more if you're including uh, concepts of, of old growth forests. Um, and each of these aspects of succession supports different kinds of wildlife. Um, and you can see some examples on this figure here where you have uh, meadowlarks and sparrows really uh, honing in on those open herbaceous grassland areas, um, quail, woodcock, uh, cottontail rabbits, turkey, uh, wild turkeys, also liking that sort of early succession habitat that's been a, uh, maybe undisturbed for five to 10 years. It has, it provides certain types of cover and nutrition and food uh, for these wildlife species. And then you can move along this cycle, this uh, pathway of succession into mature forests where um, some species like woodpeckers are really honed in on and will only survive and persist in areas of large, uh, unbroken forested areas. Um, so this, this idea of temporal change is, is really key when we think about wildlife management in Maryland because this process of succession happens uh, relatively quickly, actually. You know, in, in five to 10 years, you can start to see major changes and 15, 20 years pass and you really change the entire habitat um, will, will change over, over time. And so I want to also think about disturbance. And I started by mentioning this, but this whole process can get reset by a variety of types of disturbances. And here's a few different examples of things that can really set back this, this issue of succession. 
whether it's a major forest fire rolls through and burns all the trees and kills them, or disease, um, the emerald uh, ash borer um, has really killed a lot of trees and opened up a whole new set of herbaceous um, habitat in, some, uh, in our riparian areas of the state. Logging, plowing, mowing, grazing, all these different disturbances can help kind of set back or keep this successional process in these earlier stages. And then finally, to uh, bring us to even the most narrow temporal scale and to help us to think about uh, things even at the most extreme, uh, is this is a picture of a mayfly. And while they live in a larval state for up to a year, uh, once they hatch into flies, uh, many of these species will only live for a single day. So uh, temporal scale gets very um, narrowed when it comes down to certain types of species. So just to drive it home, the temporal scale is really key to how we think about wildlife management and what, what we're managing for. And then the, to wrap up our sort of broad ecological concepts, we'll talk about habitat. Um, and generally, this is um, broadly thought of as food, cover, water, and space. This is the easiest way to think about them. But when we start looking at, uh, at a broad scale of of the, uh, of the landscape of Maryland, I like to use land cover as a way to get a broad sense of habitat in the state. Um, here on the map on the left in red is the uh, area of the land of Maryland that has been developed and from 1973 uh, to 2010 on the bottom map. And you can see it's almost tripled the area of developed land that is in the state and um, this also highly influences the habitat that's available for wildlife. Um, the chart on the right um, I put together from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's cropland data layer. And it provides, um, I've color coded them into broad um, major um, land cover categories. So this, uh, this sort of peach color is uh, cropland. And these are different types of crops in the state. Um, and the uh, x-axis is hundreds of thousands of acres, as you can see. Uh, the dark gray color is developed land, uh, ranging from high intensity to low intensity on to, down to open space developed land. Um, forests are that um, lighter green color, grass and pasture in that yellow band, and then wetlands make up a pretty significant area of our, uh, of our habitat in the state as well, in terms of overall land cover in the state. Um, so if you look at this, uh, forests are still the probably the largest um, land cover area in the state. Um, and then after that, you really have a, a relatively even breakdown between agriculture, developed land, and wetlands, uh, with the sort of grasslands and, and pastures uh, making up probably the smallest um, sliver of the state's habitat land cover. And uh, part of the reason for that very small uh, value of grass and pasture is a lot of those open grasslands were, uh, are great for agriculture and have been used for growing crops um, in that top um, sphere up there. So that's the broad land cover types, but in the State Wildlife Action Plan, um, Maryland has identified 59 key habitats, and they break these up between upland habitat, the forests and um, agricultural areas, wetland habitats, where you have floodplains or wetlands, uh, streams, then you have fully aquatic habitat and others. Um, so there's a lot of variation as you dig in deeper and look more and more detailed, you can learn, um, you can see that uh, there's a lot of variety available. Um, and I like to drive this home by just showing some examples. Here's the aerial imagery of the Nanticoke River Wildlife Management Area. And on this uh, map, you can see there are these upland areas, the, what we consider drier areas where you have forests, grasslands, and uh, cropland. You have wetlands over here on the left. You can see there's both this intermixing of freshwater creeks uh, moving into tidal wetland areas. You have fully aquatic areas, riparian areas, which are described as our, our river areas, places uh, that habitats and vegetation surrounding rivers and those systems, the buffer surrounding riparian zones. And you look in even closer and you see little features like hedgerows and 
and we can't see from this map, but certainly brush piles and other characteristics that provide habitat on this landscape. So we have, um, to close our habitat discussion, I, I wanna just note briefly about the concepts of niches, generalists, and specialists. So here, this image on the left um, shows some classic, what we call edge habitat, where you move from the forested uh, tree areas to uh, grassy herbaceous cover. Um, and then there's even a, a line where you move from tall grass to very short mowed grass. Um, so the, a lot of generalist species really like this kind of edge habitat, white-tailed deer, raccoons, possums, and other, other generalist species can really thrive in this kind of environment. And Maryland offers a whole lot of it. If you drive across the Eastern shore or most part, many parts of Maryland, you'll see uh, agricultural field uh, bordered by a forest, um, bordered by a housing development. And so you see a lot of this sort of edge habitat in our fragmented parcels. Um, and while species do very well in this, there are a, a whole suite of other um, species that are really specialized. Um, a landmark study by Robert MacArthur back in the 1950s out of Pennsylvania um, found that even within a single tree species, you can have five different types of warblers utilizing different parts of that same tree species. So you have uh, very unique requirements from certain wildlife species and very general requirements for others, um, just to show this broad continuum of what's, uh, what's available for wildlife in the state. So to wrap up, we've talked about spatial scale and how important it is to think about our physiographic region that we're in, as well as potential microhabitat features. Um, and then thinking about temporal scale and the issue of disturbance and succession and how uh, landscapes and vegetation and habitat changes over time um, on the scales of human lifetimes that we can even see. And then finally, we've talked uh, about habitat and the different issues and uh, parts that people, that wildlife will use. So onto our second leg of our stool is uh, we'll dig, dig into a little bit more into wildlife ecology. I'll talk uh, briefly, we'll do a rundown of the major groups and the different conservation, the species of conservation concern. Talk about population dynamics and some theoretical aspects of that and wildlife interactions. So there's about six major groups of wildlife that we use to sort of think about and categorize species. But the mammals, there's 97 species of mammals in Maryland and 41 of them are of conservation concern. Um, most of those tend to be bats, marine mammals like whales and uh, various dolphins um, that are still, uh, that are mammals. And we don't really think of them as, as a, a wildlife species in Maryland, but certainly in the waters of Maryland or off of Maryland, uh, a lot of marine mammals um, and montane mammals. There's a lot of species up in the Appalachian Plateau um, because Maryland also has a very narrow area of habitat, some of these species, uh, while common in other parts of the Appalachian Mountains, uh, might be very limited here in Maryland. Reptiles, here's a picture of a snapping turtle, an iconic uh, reptile here in Maryland. Uh, we have 47 species, about half of those are of conservation concern. A lot of times this has to do with habitat loss, um, uh, changing uh, and changing of land use that's uh, taken away habitat from these species. Amphibians, there's 42 species of amphibians in the state. Amphibians, uh, amphi means uh, two types. Um, so they live both in water and on land. Um, they breathe through their skin and there's 19 of those that are of conservation concern. And in North America, it's really a great hotspot for amphibian diversity in the whole world. Um, so it's actually uh, quite a, we live in a very unique, unique area for amphibians um, and they're really an interesting um, suite of species. Birds, of course, there's 443 species that have been recorded in the state uh, in the last 150 years or so. And 143 of those are of conservation concern, according to the State Wildlife Action Plan. 
Um, fish, over 300 species. Again, this includes a lot of the open ocean species. 31 of those are of concern. And then invertebrates. And this is an area of, uh, where there's just a huge amount that we just don't have a lot of information on because there's just so many species. Uh, we've had uh, the Maryland uh, Wildlife Action Plan has uh, estimated there's about 350 that have concern. There could be many more that we just don't even really know that much about or aren't able to document. Um, so I wanted to go through that because to emphasize how very diverse wildlife are and how the various approaches are very diverse as well. So now we've covered sort of the broad categories of wildlife. I'd like to delve into some of the population dynamics and how wildlife populations change. And we'll start by uh, talking about the concept of carrying capacity. And many of you might already be familiar with this idea, but it's uh, the idea of a maximum population size that, of a species that can be sustained in a specific environment. Now, what does that look like in practice? I like, I'm a visual learner, so I always uh, like to put things on a chart uh, and use charts to help explain things. Um, you can see right here on where this dashed red line is, is this concept of carrying capacity. Um, the y-axis, the vertical axis, is the population of a wildlife species, and the x-axis is the time. So as we move forward in time, you see the population will exhibit oftentimes slow growth. If it starts at zero, it'll slowly grow. And as you hit this middle area, um, there's this concept of uh, fast growth or the logistic S-shaped growth curve, um, where there's plenty of resources available and there's, there's no limitations. So uh, the population can really take off very quickly. And then as you reach this concept of carrying capacity and there starts to be competition between uh, diff uh, within a species, that uh, growth rate slows down and your births start to equal the deaths. And you ideally reach some sort of a, a concept of a stable equilibrium. Um, again, this is a theoretical concept and it's called a logistic S-shaped curve. Um, and uh, it's, good, it's good for us to help visualize and think about wildlife. So the four factors for populations that really drive it are birth, death, immigration coming in, and emigration leaving. And you add these together and you can find uh, whether your population is growing or going down. In reality, uh, from that, uh, what really happens is uh, you have this uh, logistic shape curve with the blue line here, um, this sort of uh, theoretical ideal. But in reality, you have this red line where you have this movement uh, above and below carrying capacity as the births or deaths uh, overshoot or undershoot um, the actual carrying capacity of the species. Um, so this overshoot idea is, is a potential issue, especially where we have a high density wildlife species like white-tailed deer. Uh, it can lead to habitat damage uh, the loss of certain understory shrubs as those populations really can eat themselves out of house and home and reduce the ability for the landscape to support them uh, that then leads to something of a crash afterwards and then a rebuilding back up. Another aspect uh, in addition to carrying capacity is the animal characteristics themselves. And two things, I put, have a picture of a rabbit and the tortoise and the hare here um, to think about two, two concepts that really will hopefully drive home how much individual animal characteristics can affect their populations. Um, longevity and sexual maturity, uh, to name a couple. So uh, everybody uh, probably is pretty familiar with that. Rabbits um, are well known to be able to exhibit high fecundity or have a very high birth rate and have population explosions as a result of that. Um, but they're also relatively short-lived. Um, maybe a rabbit will in the wild live five, probably 10 years would be a very, very old rabbit in the wild. Whereas on the right, you have the snapping turtle, which is known for having actually a very short, slow 
uh, both very long lived, but also relatively slow to reach sexual maturity. The es es biologists estimate it takes 10 to 15 years for a snapping turtle to reach uh, breeding age. So you have this very distinct uh, differences between the rabbit, which can breed after uh, when it's one year old, uh, compared to a turtle, uh, the snapping turtle, it takes 10 years before it's able to breed. And so this leads to very different population dynamics. And wildlife biologists will oftentimes uh, describe these um, two concepts under either what we'll call our selected species in red, um, which would be the rabbits, where you have this ability to far overshoot carrying capacity. Um, the population is, is too many to support itself, and then it'll eat all the resources available, and then it will crash. And you have this sort of up and down cycle of, of rabbits that's very common with our selected species. Whereas K selected species um, might be more indicative of something like a snapping turtle, where they're much uh, slower to change their life. Uh, their populations don't, don't spike as quickly. Um, and you have uh, much more gradual changes and much more of an equilibrium type of um, population change. And then in terms of wildlife interactions, um, and this will close the sort of wildlife ecology the theoretical part, and here's a food web on the right. And it shows, many of us are probably familiar with this, but it shows on the bottom, the major aspects of the producers the uh, vegetation that really feeds the larger ecosystem. Uh, most of the energy uh, starts right here from the sun and feed and creates that vegetation. It moves on up uh, to uh, various herbivores that will eat, eat seeds or the vegetation itself. And then there are the consumers, the predators that eat um, these primary uh, consumers. So. Um, and the insects that then also uh, are herbivores and there's secondary predators on those. And then there's third level predators on the predaceous insects and then the snakes and then the hawks uh, and moving on up. So there's several chains um, available in this system. And these interactions um, have been well documented to, to exist and how one, pot, one species or a keystone species can really drive the larger food web. Um, this figure on the left shows uh, is a classic image of data from the amount of pelts that were uh, harvested um, in the 1845 to 1937 by the Hudson Bay Company. And in blue are the number of pelts that were harvested from snowshoe hares, and in orange are Canada lynx. So you have this, um, again, this R selected. Uh, aspect of the snowshoe hare populations uh, peaking and crashing and peaking and crashing every seven to eight years. And the Canada lynx, which almost exclusively feeds on these snowshoe hares, also following those very similar um, up and down cycles um, of those snowshoe hares. So there's a lot of interactions. Uh, if it wasn't complicated enough, uh, to manage wildlife with all the diversity. There's all of these wild um, interactions happening in our ecosystems, um, many of which we might not even be aware of. So now I uh, want to shift pages into management and how uh, we can start to influence wildlife populations. Um, and we'll think about it in terms of managing the populations themselves, managing the habitat, and then managing the people and their interactions with people. So the definition of wildlife management is influencing the interactions among and between wildlife, habitat, and people to achieve certain goals. And I always like to emphasize that the, uh, our goals are really um, helps to drive wildlife management. What, what are we trying to achieve? Because sometimes uh, if you're trying to help one particular species, it might hurt another. Um, just because uh, of those very unique uh, niches that we've described earlier and the particular needs of different types of wildlife. So again, I think of this in terms of those three categories we see in the definition in bold, wildlife habitat, um, wildlife habitat, and people. So we'll 
cover a little bit on each of these three themes. In terms of managing populations, um, one of the main uh, ways to directly manage wildlife populations is through hunting and trapping. Um, for those who aren't very familiar with, with hunting, uh, it's certainly uh, unregulated and market hunting and the um, prior to the 1900s uh, led to significant declines of wildlife. Um, but towards the end of the 1800s, uh, a number of hunters actually in, in hopes of maintaining their sport and the activity they loved, uh, really helped uh, to start the conservation movement and helped to develop mechanisms to fund wildlife recovery. Um, much of that started through um, the development of hunting seasons and hunting licenses in the late 1800s. And these, these funds were then used to help fund uh, restoration efforts. Um, in 1937, uh, the Congress passed the Pittman-Robertson Act, uh, which put a 10% tax on firearm and ammunition sales. Um, and between hunting licenses and ammunition and firearm sales, um, these funds help support the vast majority of the state natural resource department um, budgets. And that's especially true for Maryland. Uh, I think it's 99%, maybe even more, uh, of Maryland Department of Natural Resources is funding through uh, hunting license and firearm ammunition sales uh, taxes. Um, so there's this sort of um, concept of uh, population management, um, supporting uh, natural resources agencies and helping to support uh, conservation, um, but also this uh, in the absence of a lot of natural predators uh, with the lack of wolves and um, lack of mountain lions in the state, uh, we really have very high uh, populations of white-tailed deer, and it's been well documented over the last several decades um, that these deer can can really wreak havoc on um, particular plant species, on forest regeneration, and on biodiversity. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of reason to think to use uh, use efforts of population control and hunting to help uh, manage these populations. And uh, not only does it help the ecosystem and the vegetation management, but it also uh, provides uh, people with, um, with uh, food for um, organic uh, meat for, for consumption. And if anybody here is interested in learning more about how to harvest deer, a lot of people, um, first, when they might move to an area where there are deer, are really excited about them and really uh, love to see them. And I still enjoy seeing them in my yard. Um, but as they're around longer and they start to uh, damage uh, landscaping and plants in one's yard, and they seem to always uh, seem to always uh, graze off the the flowers right when they're about to bloom. Um, it's like the most uh, most tender, nutritious part of a rose plant. Uh, life must be right before opening that flower. Um, oftentimes people can get pretty fed up with, with deer populations. And so there's a lot of resources available um, on what you can do if you'd like to learn how to um, harvest deer uh, from your area. And there's hunter education programs. Uh, there's a really great Becoming an Outdoors Woman uh, program here in Maryland. Uh, there are various outreach programs, mentored hunting opportunities, and for those who might have agricultural areas or land, um, there are also permits that are made available that help uh, landowners uh, reduce damage to uh, commercial crops, um, and it opens up hunting um, outside of the normal hunting seasons. So there's managing populations. Now we'll think about managing the habitat itself. And again, that habitat's food, cover, water, and space. And so I've highlighted five different areas in which um, people can manage habitat and, uh, and change, help to uh, improve species, uh, improve habitat for species, or uh, maybe even deter um, species. Um, my first, uh, sorry to jump ahead there. The first uh, topic I have is removing invasive species. Um, and we'll talk about managing succession, changing vegetation, creating nesting habitat, and then talk about special habitat features. 
In terms of removing invasive species, um, one of the first things to do is to make sure you can identify the species correctly. And I will say that I've been um, really amazed by the um, strides and changes that have occurred in our smartphone's ability to, uh, to identify plants for us. Um, the one I like to use the most is Seek, um, S-E-E-K. It's uh, developed out of a partnership with iNaturalist which is another app you can use on your phone. Um, the difference between these two is that Seek is more something that you can use for yourself um, and it's for your own um, sort of personal record keeping, whereas iNaturalist is more geared towards sharing um, information on the broader, into a, a broader community. Um, so iNaturalist, it goes up, your observations will go up on a map and other people can view them and you have uh, a sort of social media presence there. Um, Seek is uh, just as good. They both identify things just as well. Seek might be even a little bit easier, um, and it doesn't share anything back up onto the cloud, so it's a little bit more privacy-oriented um, and doesn't put everything up onto the cloud. Um, I will tell a little story about uh, when I came around to really using these apps. I was quite skeptical as they would actually work. Uh, and it was actually a couple of years ago when I was out with a botanist friend and he was identifying uh, a particular type of clover species in California. And one of the students um, popped up one of these apps and took a picture of it and said, actually, uh, sir, uh, don't this is this app saying it's actually this different species than what you just said it was. And he grabs his hand lens out and looks at the minute details of some of the plant and said, oh, goodness actually, yeah, that thing's right. Um, it's, it's correctly identified. It, uh, the app has, has, uh, has beaten him. And he was a very, a very knowledgeable and uh, good botanist. So at that point, I started really taking these apps pretty seriously. And they've really allowed me, as somebody who's not a botanist, to come in and learn a lot about what is growing in my backyard and really go on a journey of discovery, what is native, what's not, is this an invasive weed or not? So uh, really great tool to have. Um, in terms of birds, um, identification tools, uh, the Sibley Guide to Birds is the, if you like hard books and paper copies, it's the, uh, I'd, I'd say it's the standard for birders in North America. Uh, and using uh, binoculars uh, is really key because they can be far away and hard to see. Um, but there are also apps available that once you observe um, your bird species, you can help uh, find out, these can help you find out what you saw um, in your yard. So I had that little aside and in, to introduce us into invasive species management. So um, and I first say identify and control. Um, sometimes uh, people will view, I uh, might think, oh, that's a thistle, it must be invasive. Well, there are several native uh, thistles in certain areas. And so you wanna make sure what you're taking out is actually uh, something that's not supposed to be there. Um, so this uh, image on the bottom left is Japanese stilt grass. It's a very widespread uh, dominant invasive species in our landscape. And um, it's probably over on the red side of this graph on the right. And you might recognize this uh, this, in, this curve, we just saw it a little bit ago, and, and that looks like an S-shaped logistic growth curve. And uh, when uh, some of these invasives are first introduced, they, are, uh, they have relatively slow growth period. They uh, definitely can be eradicated and stopped upon detection. But as that growth rate increases around that yellow zone, um, eradication moves from something that's feasible to something that's very unlikely or even um, maybe even, maybe, well, not impossible, um, undesirable because of the amount of effort it would take and the impact it would have on the environment to get rid of this. So um, this uh, Japanese still grass, again, is probably over on that far right area, but uh, local control over local control and management um, can manage in certain areas. And that's where, um, it's good for homeowners and, and people who, who have relatively small areas to own. You can make a difference in taking some of these things out of your area. You can manage your property more intensively than 
we can a landscape. And so you can actually uh, make a difference at a small scale to uh, improve habitat for native species, uh, which has all these carry on effects, um, like we saw in that uh, food web. Uh, one thing that uh, I like to do, I've been experimenting with myself, is um, even leaving parts of your yard unmowed for a little bit. Uh, let the wildflowers come up and see what's in the seed bank. Um, I've uh, been surprised. This is Philadelphia fleabane. It's a common roadside weed, but it's also a nice pollinator habitat. And so by leaving this uh, to grow, it created this nice little uh, patch of wildflowers. And it was really neat to see a, an eastern Phoebe, uh, which is a flycatcher, um, nested um, under, our, under our deck. Um, and uh, I would see it actually foraging in these uh, for flies and other um, pollinators in these sort of wildflower patches. So you have this sort of example of uh, the vegetation moving uh, from uh, the vegetation attracting uh, more flies and more pollinators, and that then attracting birds and flycatchers, which are in insect insectivorous birds um, that then um, will inhabit an area. Uh, I also wanted to briefly talk about, um, and since we're talking about grasslands and letting them grow, uh, there is a bobwhite quail initiative here on the Eastern shore. Um, and uh, bobwhite quail are, were very common just 40 years ago in the state and have undergone uh, double digit declines for, for many years now. And there's a few pockets left in the state. And so uh, I'm working with uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service as well as uh, Maryland Department of Natural Resources and some other other groups like the Natural Lands Project um, out of uh, out of uh, Kent County, I believe, uh, to help work on finding ways to establish warm season grasslands. So these birds uh, really need a particular type of grassland, and that's, here's a picture, a good picture of it here on the right, where, where there are a few coveys left in this area. Um, but it's it's not just any grassland. Um, there's a big difference between the warm season grasses, which tend to be uh, bunch grasses and uh, like little blue stem and big big blue stem and others, um, and cool season grasses, which tend to form a very thick mat um, that is not as conducive for wildlife to move around in and utilize. Um, these types of grasslands do. Uh, do require some maintenance to, to keep up. Um, they can be burned or disked on a two to three year rotation to keep them from succeeding into shrubland and forested areas. Um, and I have to just let everybody know, and, and it's an unfortunate thing, but uh, just reintroducing pin raised birds um, hasn't worked, unfortunately. They just can't survive in the wild. Um, for reintroduc reintroductions of this species, uh, it's usually done over the course of multiple years of restocking of trapped wild um, bobwhite quail um, in conjunction with pretty intensive habitat management. Other types of habitat improvement work is to uh, that we've I've been experimenting with at the Y uh, research uh, farm is the uh, planting a variety of preferred species. Um, there's some great resources, Craig Harper out of the University of Tennessee has developed a great landowner's guide to wildlife food plots. Here's a picture of Joe Street from the Y uh, helping to plant some uh, variety of cover crops which are oriented towards wildlife uh, for attracting deer that, the, that can then be harvested to reduce, uh, reduce deer densities. Um, in terms of timber stand improvement and reducing, setting back that successional stage if you're um, if you're looking to attract certain, to have a more desirable forested area, uh, hack and squirt is an approach that can be used to manage habitat. You can see here, uh, use a small ax or hatchet to um, cut holes, cut areas in the uh, bark of certain saplings and trees, then you squirt uh, herbicide in there. And it's a very effective way to um, manage one's forest. And, uh, nesting habitat is also can be a limiting factor for a variety of species, um, especially those that use cavity nests. Um, 
traditionally, generally people have, for safety reasons have had to take out dead trees. Um, and this leads to fewer of these uh, natural cavities in certain areas. So the development of artificial cavity nests can really help to provide a needed resource for some of these um, some of these bird species that need, that require that. Um, if you're going to put in nest boxes, uh, make sure that you use a, a predator guard. Um, they have found that artificial nest boxes have higher predation uh, than natural ones because um, predators quickly learn how to uh, identify and uh, hone in on nest boxes. So if you can use uh, some cones, a three foot cone uh, to mostly prevent uh, raccoons or snakes from getting into the nest boxes and, the, and uh, consuming uh, the chicks. Um, I've also uh, learned from some other colleagues, some other approaches such as PVC pipe, uh, which around those uh, stands as a way to help reduce snake um, uh, snake entrance, and it seems to be very effective. Um, happy to talk with other with people uh, on approaches for that um, afterwards. Um, and then special features. Um, here's a on the bottom left is an image of an old, uh, large, uh, probably 120 year old red oak tree um, that has died, and allowing that to stand if it's in a safe place um, provides. As you can see, as that bark is falling off of it, um, there are hundreds, probably thousands of different uh, invertebrates living and consuming um, that wood, uh, which then attracts woodpeckers and provides uh, opportunities for them to create cavities into that, into the wood uh, and a variety of habitat tools there, habitat needs for other species. Uh, we also have uh, uh, brush piles and rock piles I found that it seems almost even as though rocks, these uh, sort of rock piles seem to really attract uh, various lizards and toads. Um, they seem to really like these sort of um, rock habitats. And then we're gonna close with managing humans. So we talked about managing wildlife populations, managing the vegetation, and we'll wrap up here by talking about how to manage human impacts. Um, we saw that slide, that map on the right of the improve, the larger area of uh, development here in the state. And this image on the, the bottom shows what was previously a farm and forested area with minimal activity has was platted out in 2007 um, with probably about uh, 25, 30 homes. Um, and so these homes certainly, uh, the footprint of the homes themselves isn't particularly large. Um, but we know that there's a lot of activity that goes along with, with the homes and a lot of different types of uh, things that are planted in there um, and other, uh, other, other things, uh, lights and other types of pollution. So um, I'll put, put a plug in here for uh, Dr. Doug Talamay's uh, work um, to basically try to encourage people to use their yards at, to improve habitat. Um, there is so much private land, and we saw there's about a quarter of Maryland's land area is in developed uh, land cover space. And if all of us um, take a little bit more care to improve habitat, even on these smaller acreages, they can really add up to very significant areas. And some things you can do to do that is, is planting of native plants, um, removing invasives, and some of the things we're talking about right here. Um, one of those impacts uh, that I think can be really detrimental um, if we're not careful is the use of pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. Um, these can be particularly damaging for amphibians. They have permeable skin. So if uh, pesticides make it into the waterways, um, they can quickly eradicate and damage uh, huge areas of, uh, of uh, these uh, amphibian populations. So it's uh, great to be really careful. Always follow the pesticide and herbicide lab labels. Um, in particular, one of the things you wanna make sure is make sure it's not gonna rain um, at least 24 hours after application of herbicides or pesticides. Um, you wanna make sure that that stuff doesn't get washed into the streams and before it dries. Um, 
and I'll put a, 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 warn, uh, a warning out there. Some of these uh, herbicides, for example, have, can have very long residuals. Uh, glyphosate actually has a rel glyphosate or Roundup uh, has actually a relatively short uh, residual life. It, it degrades relatively quickly um, in the soil, but some others will have residuals. And I think it's a half life is on the order of a, a week or so, five to 10 days before it starts to really degrade into the soil. Uh, but some others have 45 to 60 day residuals. Um, so they, they will persist in your yard and your environment for quite a long time. So um, be cognizant, read the label. And sometimes this stuff doesn't even show up on the label. You might want to do some Google searches on the particular active ingredients to find out. I found that that was really eye opening to realize that some of these um, herbicides can last so long in the environment. Um, certainly use soil tests um, before um, applying fertilizer. You don't want to add too much fertilizer that can also um, make it into our waterways and lead to problems. So um, I also, I, I hate ticks just like everybody else. Um, and one of the tools people use to remove them is to, uh, is to spray permethrin, for example. Unfortunately, while it's very effective, um, it is not very discriminatory. It will uh, kill and eradicate almost all um, arthropods in the environment. So it not only takes out those ticks, but it also ends up taking out insects, uh, spiders. And then once you take those out, then you start have this sort of cascading effect on up this food chain where uh, the forage of it isn't as available for insectivorous, insectivorous birds, um, toads and other things. And that can have carry on effects on up the food chain. If you're a homeowner and have a domestic cats, please do try to keep them inside. Uh, if you have bird strikes, there are various uh, tools available to help reduce um, bird collisions on windows, like the spots that you'll see on the glass on the right. Uh, lighting and noise are, are, have really uh, have an impact on wildlife. Um, there's some great guides available, but in general for lighting, if you can keep, uh, you want to keep your lighting uh, as low as possible. Um, use longer wavelength lights to so the sort of more orangish or reddish colors and try to keep your light shielded. So the light goes down and not across the landscape or certainly definitely not up into the night sky uh, where all sorts of uh, moths and other um, wildlife species then will uh, be affected by it. So with that, um, We've come to the end of, we've covered a, our three-legged, the stool, we've covered broad ecological concepts, some ecologic, uh, wildlife ecology and, and management topics. So with that, I wanna close. I think we have a few minutes here for questions. Hey, thank you, Luke, that was great. Um, I am just putting in, we just had a question that I'm answering. Somebody asked, uh, is this, will, will, will we be able to send them the recording? Yes. The recording will be sent out to you uh, using the email that you registered with. And in the chat, I actually put a link to the other Woodland Wildlife Wednesdays that if you missed any other ones or interested to kind of expand maybe uh, your knowledge, uh, I have put it there in our chat. If anybody has any questions, please type them in the chat. I see that somebody raised their hand. So why don't we go to somebody that raised their hand? So I'm gonna ask you to unmute. So Paul, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. And then if you unmute yourself, you'll be able to um, answer your, ask your question. Hopefully our roadie in the back, I didn't introduce Taylor. She's part of the forestry team that works with Luke and I. And she's in the back and she's going to let Paul uh, be able to unmute and ask your question. So, Paul, how you doing? I'm doing just fine. Thank you. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Uh, so thanks for unmuting me. Um, I, Luke, I, I appreciate the presentation. Um, one of the slides you referred to a lot so, showed a coyote as sort of the highest level mammal. So. I live, uh, I flagged you guys, I live like right in the Appalachian area by the Blue Ridge, by the, uh, the AT. Um, we have bears and bobcats and foxes. Are the coyotes we have here natives? 
Oh, um, yes. Well, that uh, picture of the food web. Um, yes, let me see if I can back up to that. Um, it's, uh, you know, this is a certainly not designed to cover all species in, in an area. And certainly yeah. uh, wolves would be even higher level apex predators than coyotes. Wolves are known to actually uh, wreak havoc, to go after wolf, after coyotes very aggressively. Um, and mountain lions would also probably be a higher level, uh, would be higher level apex predators as well. Um, are coyotes native? Um, there has, it's a difficult question. There's been a lot of work on this and there's a lot of debate on uh, exactly where coyotes came from. And traditionally they're believed to have lived further west in the Rocky Mountain areas and expanded eastward. Um, it's it's hard again. I, I uh, there this kind of goes to that issue of temporal scale. You know, if we if we zoom out far enough in the temporal scale and look over the course of thousands of years, it's possible that maybe there were coyotes uh, here um, even pre uh, very far back. Um, but they're very it's very difficult to answer some of these aspects is because uh, coyotes interbreed readily. Uh, not only with uh, yeah. other dog species, but with wolves, they can interbreed with wolves. And so there's some thinking that actually the red wolf, which is more common than the sort of Southeast area we're in now, uh, hmm. was actually something of a hybrid between gray wolves and coyotes. Um, red wolves are considered a bit smaller than the gray wolf. Um, yeah. So uh, oh. yeah, go ahead. No, no, thanks. I. I'm not, I, I didn't realize we had any wolves here. Uh, there are uh, endangered uh, red wolves that are, I think there's a small population in North Carolina. Yeah. Um, and uh, they're not here present in Maryland right now or yet. Uh, it might be quite some time before something like that would happen. But uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, well, thanks. I mean, I, you know, they, I, I get the concept of of the food web and it's it's very informative. Um, but you know, like if you had bears, you might want to put a trash can. Um, so anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> so anyway, thanks a lot. Thanks there, a lot. Certainly, managing those human impacts uh, is an issue, and and something we I didn't get too much into to sort of deterring wildlife species, but certainly these same concepts of a food, water, cover, and space can help to reduce. Some of the, uh, you know, if you can reduce the habitat like trash cans for bears, um, it can help reduce some of the problems. Uh, certainly with rodents, keeping bird seed locked up and in rodent-proof containers, uh, things like that, reducing feeding um, can reduce some of the, you know, presence of raccoons and other things like that. So, yeah. Great, great. Um, also, um, interesting food web to understand that it goes right down to the insects. I think insects get a little bit forgotten when it comes to the bigger wildlife. And I like how you talked about creating habitat and how it's, you know, just as easy as letting some flowers go uh, in your yard. So that, that was a great example. And remembering that in the forest, uh, the, the, bugs are everywhere, the insects are everywhere, the birds are everywhere. And I love that diagram you gave about the um, successional habitat, you know, where they're living and where they're eating, they need it all. So that's great. And we know that Luke is available to kind of help us create that habitat if we want it. I'm available to talk about that too when it comes to a forestry. Um, any other questions that we have? Um, I put a lot of links in the chat, you guys. If you haven't looked at that bubble, please click on that bubble. I did put a lot of links to, Luke was giving us a lot of good information that we can delve deeper in. I love how, Luke, you gave us kind of an overview, an intro to, to uh, wildlife in Maryland. And um, if you wanna dive deeper, folks, I put some uh, links in the chat to help you out. Um, any Thank other you for doing questions? That, Agnes. No prob, no prob. This is why we're a team. Oh, good. I'm glad you put your email back up there. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. uh, 
And Luke, your assignment is statewide, right? That's correct. Yeah. So even though I'm based on at the Y on the Eastern Shore, I uh, I do deal with uh, folks out in Western Maryland and uh, have uh, I've heard about. You mentioned bears. Uh, Paul mentioned bears, but uh, I've heard about um, how uh, catastrophic damage that bears can cause in some of those areas up there. So um, I do look forward to seeing that firsthand sometime soon. Great. Great. Well, thank you, Luke. We appreciate your time. Thank you all for joining Luke and I. Oh, we got, we're getting some compliments, some thumbs up. Thank you for that. Thank you for joining us. And uh, don't forget our next month is the uh, Wood Duck with Ducks Unlimited. Join us for that one. And I want to say, don't be scared, but in October, we're going to talk about Ghost Forest. And I'm going to leave it at that, keep you suspended, keep you in suspense. So see you next month for uh, the Wood Duck, uh, Wood Duck with, Did with Joan Ducks. Did Joan have her hand raised, I think? Is that a hand oh. raised for Joan? Joan, do you have a question? Yes, I was interested oh, in the you. slide that you talked about, the um, hack and squirt. Um, was that to kill undesirable trees? Yes. Because I have yes. some uh, like mulberries and a Norway maple I'd like to get. They're not you know, huge, but it's not convenient to cut them down. So if I just uh, do that, they would die and still like I could leave them as snags if they're not dangerous. Yes, exactly. And that's the nice thing about that hack and squirt. It does leave, it just creates snag habitat. Um, if they're not in a dangerous spot. And uh, a lot of different herbicides are pretty effective on that. Uh, the main thing you want to avoid there, and there's some great resources. Penn State has a, a great website on hack and squirt and the different uh, types of herbicides that they use, but everything from glyphosate to mazapir, uh, and there's probably five or six others listed on that website. They all, all are quite effective. The main thing is to do it um, not during heavy sap flow in the early, early, early spring, uh, so midsummer, or and not to do it during heavy drought periods um, as well. So you want to make sure there's there's some flow down to the roots, but not too much. But yeah, that's a, a very good way to to sort of manage these smaller sapling level um, tree undesirable trees. Thank you. And I think there's some demonstration of hack and skirts, hack and squirt and girdling on our um, Marilyn Woodland Stewart's webpage. There's some videos that uh, jo Luke mentioned, our colleague Jonathan. Um, and there's that Penn State article, which I don't have handy to put in, but I did put in the link a Forest Service article that uh, a publication by the Koken Derpers. I've been to their property. Um, they did some great stuff about fencing for orchids. So I, I, the Kokendorfers are good stewards of the land. And uh, um, any other questions or thoughts before we sign off? I like it that you guys raised your hand. I appreciate that. That was great. Oh, oh there's another one. Just me hey. again. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I get these free trees that, uh, the county donates and a couple of years ago, I planted six of them and within a, a month, of course, the deer had trashed them. So now I have six more and they're like five feet tall and I find I'm, I'm like hesitant to plant them because I don't know, you can't just use those plastic cones, you know, those pipes to um, protect such a large sapling other than putting up fence. It's just, I feel like I'm just going to go through all that work of planting just to feed the deer. Yeah. Any suggestions? Your question, what other tools you might have available? Is that what you're? Oh, yeah. Do you have any other suggestions? I mean, I, I, they, I, at one uh, place that gave me the trees, they gave me that like black plastic fencing. I just think the deer are just going to, you know, collapse that and push it into it. Yeah, um, I I believe some places. Agnes, you have probably a lot of experience, more experience with this. Do you want to feel this one? Do you have some experience? Well, with tree, you know, tree I don't know if this is I don't know if this is going to make you feel a little better, but uh, when you plant trees, you're going to think about maybe there's going to be sixty percent 
mortality of the trees that you planted. Like thinking that going in, regardless of tree tubing or not, you're going to think that there's going to be kind of a surprisingly high rate of mortality, just to let you know. Um, but I was just looking, Luke was involved in a webinar series that we did um, that has a uh, a really good webinars about, um, and I was just trying to find it on our website about tree maintenance. It does, you know, to 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 lower that percentage of mortality in tree plantings, you can, you really do need to be actively maintaining it. And the Stroud Center in Pennsylvania has some really great advice too that they shared on our website. Um, but tree tubes, I heard what you said with you think that the deer may demolish them. I haven't heard that a lot. Um, I have heard that with bears in Western Maryland. Um, now, these trees are too big for the tubes. They're branched out. It, that I have plastic fencing to put around them, but it just, you know, to make that sturdy enough, it's... Oh, like that orange plastic fencing. Yes, yeah, only like this, this is black that uh, Blue Water Baltimore was giving out? Um, you know, um, oh, go ahead. One, yeah, one thing that might uh, work in that situation is uh, hog wire fencing, uh, just like a three inch by five inch square mesh fencing. You can buy it at Home Depot or, or even online, um, but you can get it four feet or five foot tall. Um, the higher, the better, obviously, and they depending on how much pressure there is um, from the deer, they could reach up and munch above five feet, uh, some of those branches if they're sticking out, but uh, you could just create a small fence. I like to use, um, there are electric fence push-in posts uh, to help anchor it into the ground. You can use um, other kinds of stakes as well, but I found those to provide pretty good stability for the wire fencing. Uh, you can just basically, there's a little area where you can step your foot in and fix a, it's a four foot. You can get, also get them at five foot white plastic poles and they're designed for electric fencing. And you can step them into that, through that wire mesh and hook it onto it and probably do. I currently have two on each of my deer exposures around a few trees and it, they so far are holding up. Again, if the deer pressure is really high, they can push them over and mess with them. But generally I think it's probably going to solve 90%, maybe more of your problems. And if your deer pressure is that high, uh, you might want to start, might think about the uh, opportunities for increasing deer harvest and uh, uh, to try and get those densities down a little bit. Okay, thanks for the suggestions. Um, I'm putting the link in where I found that webinar series. Uh, where you can find out more about what the Stroud Center found out about deer protection. Somebody in the comments wrote, welded wire cylinders stacked to the ground are easy to make and very effective for my trees and shrubs. So thank you, David, for your suggestion on that. Um, you know, there's a, a deer repellent spray that people have found moderate success with that, um, is an investment and you'd have to do multiple applications on that. I will say there's a woman who for many, many years has used ivory soap. She's hung ivory soap from her uh, 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 grapevine so that the deer don't get them. So, you know, any and all techniques are worth a try um, as long as you're safe and everybody's safe around you. Um, but I put that link. I've also heard that with uh, Irish spring soap um, as well. That's what they use at the lower Eastern Shore Wreck. And they've had great success. If there's not, if there's other places for the deer to go uh, and feed, then, uh, you know, putting in some of these repellents can work. It, it tends to work a couple of weeks. So it would take, you know, sort of an ongoing effort to maintain them. Uh, because of that, I like fences because they, they're a little more permanent one time, one and done sort of situation. Right, right. Um, yeah, and then Joe, jo, like how to keep that fence stable. That's the, that's the question, right? And wind and whatever else and construction of it. So good luck with that. Keep us posted. You know, we're always looking to hear what landowners are doing and how they find success. 
So I hope you were able to click on that link in the chat. If you click on the chat and you can see all the links I put there, you can just click on the link in the chat and it'll take you to take you to some more information. So great conversation, you guys. Thank you for joining us.